Thank you so much for joining us today, Crown Prince Reza Pathlavi of Iran. It's wonderful to see you again and always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for being here with us on Peace One Day. Good to see you too, Fiona, and I'm happy to be with you today on this program. And um, the first place I'd love to start is if you could tell us more about your life journey and career to date. Well, it's been a journey, as you said. Uh, um, obviously, when I was growing up uh, as a young uh, boy, um, my destiny was supposed to be something uh, different than what it is today. Um, I left my country uh, when I was about 17 and a half. Right after my high school graduation, I came to the United States to undergo a pilot training program in Reese Air Force Base. And it was during that period that uh, the revolution um, happened in Iran. And as a result, uh, my whole life direction changed. I wasn't able to go back to Iran for obvious reasons. And so from the very beginning, um, uh, after my father had passed away, I basically was in the thick of the Iranian opposition politics from the get-go. Um, including uh, the first eight years when Iran and Iraq, unfortunately, uh, had a war. And uh, uh, I'm remembering the early 80s and everything that was happening then. Uh, and I will spare you 43 years in details, but fast forward to the point we are today. It has been basically a, a mission in life for me to see that uh, my compatriots uh, are finally liberated from uh, this tyrannical regime. And... Uh, uh, with the hope that um, in uh, in a true sense of uh, self-determination and democratic freedoms and human rights uh, and, of course, the rule of law, a country can get back on track of, of progress. So it's been really uh, a whole lifetime of dedicating myself to this cause. And that has been pretty much my, uh, my journey uh, in all these years. And an incredible one. And it's taken you across the world and you've not been back to Iran since, have you? No, I, I mean, I, I couldn't because I'm, I'm basically on the hit list uh, of the regime. So uh, there's no way that I would uh, be able to go there under the current circumstances. But as soon as this regime is gone, then everything changes. And I'm sure that together with uh, many of my compatriots will be able to travel uh, to our country and be able to uh, be with our compatriots and, and, and help from near as opposed to from a far distance. Of course, of course. And, you know, as we talk about it today, uh, on a day of peace, Global Day of Peace, September 21st, um, is, a, is a moment for people together can discuss and share what peace and sustainability looks like and means for them. What do these moments of standing together um, mean to you? And why are they so important for us to come together for a peaceful, a peaceful life? In terms of humanity as a whole, and when we see so many different countries, cultures, civilizations, and what have you, um, we are a very diverse kind uh, in, in all these senses. And how could you maintain um, a healthy relationship given that diversity? It's a matter of how big you think this world is or maybe how small actually it is. When when I think of it, that's my description. When I look at our planet and so many challenges we face from environmental issues to sustainability from uh, water crisis or food resources, we don't have time to be at war with one another. We have to work together to solve common problems, regardless of where on the planet or in which country we live. So it all depends on, at first, what kind of a philosophy do we want to have for ourselves? Do we respect each other's uh, opinions or faiths or ideologies or sexual orientations and what have you? It it it, it has a root uh, cause, in my opinion, for countries that are at peace with one another. And I think when you look at uh, democracies on the planet, there's a reason why democracies don't go at war with one another. And I think a lot of it is because there's rule of law, because there's accountability, because there is the right of citizens protected under the law. I'm not saying the world is perfect. It certainly is not. But at least we could say for those countries that benefit from such liberties, then peace in a way is a byproduct of that. 
Um, if there's still areas when we see conflict, when we see uh, problems, is because a there's probably not the rule of law as we see it in in, in Western uh, uh, you know standards, or there's absence of human rights because again uh, the the nature of the system is, is an undemocratic one, and as a result we see conflict and we see a lack of peace. So, uh, is the entire world at peace today? No. Can we go in that direction? Of course. But I think we cannot just sit back and observe others to sort of by miracle achieve it. What I'm trying to say here is that countries that do have that state have to look beyond their own borders and their own self and say, well, we are okay. Too bad in such a region we have this problem. I think it it is an added responsibility, a moral responsibility for countries that can be messengers of peace to try and bring the rest of the world in that fold and communications and 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 uh, contact i think is critical for that media has some role to play but i must tell you one thing fiona ever since social media became a secondary tool for people to be able to communicate and voice their opinion we hear so much more and i think that's an untapped resource that it has yet to be fully realized in terms of its potential to achieve these goals because messaging and communication and connectivity uh, has to be there. You can't just print a principle on paper and assume it's going to just by miracle happen. You have to work it constantly. Uh, I absolutely agree. And I think you're exactly right. When we have some level of peace, being able to outreach to others who are not in such an uh, such a similar environment, it's our kind of honor and opportunity to serve and to actually show what is possible and to support one another. And I think as you're talking about communications as well, it's a tool that can be used in such a positive way as, as us coming together today and sharing in these conversations. And I think also we have obstacles to overcome as you've just spoken about. I mean, what would you say would be the greatest obstacle that humans have to overcome today to survive? I might... Uh say something that some people will consider provocative or controversial. But I really think that when you look at the most, at uh, the highest reason for cause of people dying outside of natural disasters, somehow takes roots in religion. Uh, funny that each religion claims to be messengers of peace, but we've seen more people killing each other in the name of religion than any other reason. Does religion have to disappear? I'm not suggesting that. But secular principles, separation of religion from governance that may influence the policies of certain countries may be one of the reasons uh, that would uh, probably remedy the problem. That's an elephant in the room that a lot of people would not want to discuss. Uh, I dare to bring this up because otherwise we'll be just, you know, uh, not being realistic. But, you know, I think the religious factor is one of the most important one. And when you look at countries that are more impoverished, uh, and, you know, impoverished, or, or there's poverty or there's lack, lack, of, lack of education, then that factor even augments more. So I think if you bring in the element of uh, keeping religion a private matter and not allowing it to influence uh, public life in the sense of becoming a dominant ideology versus another, case in point, the Islamic regime in Iran. And you can see what it's done uh, in terms of um, uh, what happened to our own citizenry, but also its negative impact on the world because it's based on a single ideology. So as long as you can eliminate eliminate the ideological aspect of it, and as long as people are guaranteed their, their freedom to have their face without fear of persecution of one form or another, which leads to conflict and ultimately <laughs> uh, peace again is compromised, um, this is something that we need to discuss more thoroughly and not just for the sake of political expedience, uh, brush it under the rug or basically be afraid of talking about it as it should be treated as a taboo subject. I don't think it's a taboo subject, but the time has come to finally recognize that in my view, it's one of the critical factors that has an impact on whether or not we can pursue uh, roads to more peace. I appreciate you sharing, and we're here to really discuss 
what is possible and what is going on in the world. So I, I really appreciate you sharing so openly with us today. And that's how we overcome obstacles by communicating as we touched on previously as well. And I think with all that's happening in the world just now, the protection of each other and resources is such an important piece. And although things seem to be spiraling out of control to some degree with all that's going on in the world, there's still an opportunity for hope. And I'm curious where you, you managed to draw your hope for it from for the world. Yeah, I mean, um, what are the key uh, prerequisites for people to have a positive outlook to, to life as opposed to desperation? And usually when you're desperate, you become cynical, you become radicalized as a result. And that is certainly not a recipe for where we want to go. On the other hand, if you're guaranteed your rights, if you have the security of personal life and property and have, you know, an element of stability that leads to tranquility, that leads to positive thinking, that you're not harmed by anything, you're not threatened by anything. Again, I go back to the basics of uh, rule of law and, 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 and people's guaranteed rights on their uh, their constitutional rights uh, in any country, if it's based on a democratic system and, and, and values. As such, you you start on the right on the right foot, and uh, some places already have uh, acquired these rights. Uh, but even in the in the most uh, advanced democracies, we sometimes see uh, some deviation from it. Uh, case in point: the United States in the last decade has uh, witnessed so many incidents that uh, pretty much uh, uh, might be a bit threatening when it comes to, well, what's the outlook? Are people thinking positively or not? And that's one of the freest countries in the world. Imagine what happens in countries that are far more restricted and what's the outlook? So uh, I think the recipe and the ingredients uh, are pretty much out there for all of us to recognize. The question is, can we implement them? Can we actually make it happen? Where is it that there has to be that extra effort to make sure that those in most need of such supports uh, benefit from it? In other words, we cannot simply say, well, they're isolated. We don't want to go out there and, and intervene because that will be inter inter interference. And that's another point I wanted to raise in today's uh, discussion. What constitutes interference? If interference is in a positive way, in other words, if it's help added, and of course, as if it's requested from, from, from nations that want to receive such support, then I think it's absolutely okay uh, to get involved and not allow for any injustice to occur. I guess the best example of this in, in, in recent history would be what happened in South Africa and, the, and then an end to apartheid. It did not happen only because South Africans were asking for it. The whole world said enough is enough and we can no longer tolerate that. So uh, that's pretty much the kind of uh, uh, vision that I think would be good to have more and more and for people not to feel comfortable only in their own confines, but to think of it as a collective effort because, you know, we might be happy in one side of the planet while the other side of the planet is suffering. Then in reality, it's a, uh, it's a fake sense of, uh, of tranquility, because for hope to the level that you're hoping to achieve uh, has to exist universally, then it has to leave no one behind. That's where we finally can say there's true reason for positiveness and, and hope. So we need to help those in, in most need and not just uh, be beneficiaries of it at, and not others benefiting for it as well. I, I love what you've just shared there. And it, it, it it resonates with everything that we're discussing today. And on the final note, as, as we kind of conclude on this, one of my questions and my last question to you would be, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned through your life and all that you've been through? You know, I had, um, of course, the uh, opportunity to travel to so many different countries around the globe, four corners of the world, literally speaking, from uh, Japan and China to Brazil to countries in Africa to Europe, I mean, all sorts of different uh, places and cultures. And I think there are three fundamental uh, elements uh, that I think any human being 
uh, expects. Uh, the first one is freedom. Nothing gets going without the first element, which is freedom. The second one is uh, justice, and justice can only be attained when you have the proper system in place. So it's a matter of governance and the rules and the institutions. But there's a third element that I think is seldom talked about, but I think it's also a key factor, and that's dignity, human dignity. I've seen people in the worst economic situation have a smile on their faces because they still felt dignified in whatever it is that we're doing or not. And if you take dignity from people away, even if they have freedom, and even if they have uh, uh, you know, justice, still, if their di- dignity is hurt, you're not talking about uh, being a you know uh, an individual that can be on those three notes content and i think these are the three ingredients that i've noticed regardless of which culture and which country i travel to if those elements exist in those countries then generally that population is happier is more content and if one of those factors doesn't exist then definitely there's something wrong and they cannot possibly be content. So that's my own experience in life, having seen and talked to all sorts of people, different walks of life, different sectors of society, from taxi drivers to merchants to soldiers to you name it, all sorts of people. And I think that's, again, another element that to me is a universal uh, matter. It's not limited to a particular regional culture or civilization. It's it's, it's, it's a universal uh, factor. That That's my lesson, having traveled all these countries. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for joining us today on the day of peace around the world. Um, I can't thank you enough for all the work that you're doing, joining us and what you're doing for Iran, Iranians and everyone globally. So thank you so much, Crown Prince of of Iran, Reza Pathlavi. It's been wonderful to have you today. Thank you, Fiona, and uh, all the best to all uh, freedom-loving people and for peace to finally become universal. Thank you so much.